Good morning. Uh, my name is Shugato Ray, and I teach in the history of art department here at UC Berkeley and a co-founder of the South Asia Art Initiative. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Today's conversation is part of the UC Berkeley South Asia Art Initiative's Vital Love Collector Speak series. In response to the global pandemic, the South Asia Art Initiative launched four programs last year, a series titled Crisis and Creativity, Artists Speak, a Virtual Artist Residency, and Awards for the Best Doctoral Dissertation on South Asian Art, written in Europe and North America, and a Best MFA Thesis. The fourth series, Vital Love, Collector Speak series, addresses the collecting of South Asian art and its intersections with art history and museum practices. Today's conversation is part of the series. I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Gosharan Sidhu and Professor Naman Ahuja. Dr. Sidhu holds degrees from IIT Madras and Stanford University. After a long career in academics and the technology sector, Dr. Sidhu now focuses his passion for the arts of India. Dr. Sindhu was formerly co-chairman of the board of the Smithsonian's Freer and Sackler Galleries and currently serves on the board of trustees of the Seattle Art Museum, the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore, as well as the acquisition committee of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. He is currently writing a comprehensive study on the collection of paintings that he and his wife, Elvira, have collected over the years. And we're all greatly looking forward to the book. Professor Naman Ahuja joins us from New Delhi, where he is Professor of Indian Art and Architecture at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has curated several exhibitions, most notably the Body in Indian Art and Thought, which I had the privilege of seeing in Brussels, and I think that was the last time I met Naman. He has published numerous books, including The Making of Modern Indian Art, the, I'm sorry, The Making of the Modern Indian Artist, Craftsman, Devi Prasad, The Art and Archaeology of Ancient India, a comprehensive study of the Ashmolean's collection of ancient Indian statuary and archaeological material with a focus on terracotta and small finds of this period. He has also co-edited A Mediated Magic, The Indian Presence in Modernism, 1880 to 1930. Professor Ahuja received his PhD in art and archaeology from SOAS at the University of London in 2001. Before we begin, a quick note. Our two speakers today will have a conversation for around 15, minute, 15 minutes, and then we open it up for, for Q&A. Please do feel free to submit your question via the Q&A function at the bottom bar of the Zoom webinar. With that, please welcome Dr. Sidhu and Dr. Ahuja on the stage, the virtual stage. Hi, thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah, lovely to be here. Why don't I kick things off? Yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me first of all, uh, thank uh, Deepthi Mathur, a dear friend and someone who's a, a tremendous uh, enthusiast in all things related to Indian art for somehow roping me into the, doing this event. Uh, and to Professor Ray for uh, the invitation and then for agreeing to uh, invite Naman, whom, whose work I have admired for a long time more than his work, his eye, uh, to be the curatorial participant in this conversation. Uh, I think it's really hard for Naman to kind of be up this late uh, in Delhi. Uh, I was earlier worried that he would be in Kasoli where he was with his mom. And uh, even though my entire career has been concerned with the internet, uh, and my great faith in it, I was a little worried how we would handle things if uh, the Indian connectivity system didn't perform to par. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, we are here together now. 
Well, yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, Gosharan. Yes, I thought I would um, do the honor of driving down to Delhi for, for this talk so that we had better connectivity. We've been plagued with all kinds of issues around um, poor connectivity for the past year. And um, I'm afraid um, I can't let the opportunity go to let everyone in the Bay Area and in Seattle know that uh, the world is not an equal place yet with, <laughs> with the internet. Uh, but having, having said that, I, I really want to thank you for inviting me to have this conversation with you. You know, for some years ago, I think it was about three, four years ago when I was at your home in Seattle and I, you shared your paintings. And I remember taking lots of pictures on my phone. And over these years, I have browsed at that album of pictures, through that album of pictures so many times, just for my pleasure. Um, and I never thought I would have to um, subject my pleasure to public scrutiny in this manner and make it into something that was going to be pedagogical. And I am a reluctant imposter in the world of Indian painting. You are uh, people who are so much more specialized in the field than I am. But I, I hope the kind of things I've selected out of this fantastic array of pictures that you have um, gives us a chance to talk about some issues that might be instructive for the students and for others to be able to see what are the kind of ways in which we are shifting our studies in the field of Indian painting. So thank you very much for allowing me this, this opportunity to do this. And, um, and thank you, Shogata, for, for making it happen. Uh, and thank you very much, Kunita, for handling all the logistics for it. Um, yeah, well, what are my criteria? I mean, I can come to that straight away. Um, as I was saying, I think what really attracted me to your paintings was a certain immediacy in the visual language. There's a sense of drama, there's a quality of the line. There's a lot that these pictures, it's a, it's a collection that communicates a lot. Every picture says so much. And I want to try and um, unpack for us as to what it is about the pictures that is so attractive that grabs our interest immediately. Is it because of a certain kind of a cultural conditioning? Is it because of, um, what is it, what are the building blocks of the aesthetic? Is it a matter of a line and form only? Or is there more to it that is making you or me select one painting over another? Um, and what are the criteria that we are holding, um, holding up when we are making those selections? And, um, and do, these criteria, do these criteria keep shifting? Are we, have you held on to the same collection or when you buy a new work, do you um, let something go? And when you let it go, wh wh why? why? Why does it allow, what allows you to let it go? Um, you know, does your eye keep developing and changing? Do your priorities keep changing? Are the paintings giving you something more than what you had imagined initially? And, and so is your gaze or is your knowledge conditioning what you're holding on to? Um, and I thought some of these questions might be pertinent for those in the field of academia or writing to be able to understand what is it that is sustaining one's engagement and rapport with art. So yeah. those were some of my overarching concerns that I hope we can actually get into today. You know, Naman, those are very broad questions. Um, I can only handle them from a very personal level, okay? Uh, if I understood you right, there are sort of two big aspects there. One is 
how does aesthetic sensitivity or connectivity originate? Uh, is it learned, for instance? And then how does one's engagement in a particular space, uh, artistic space, evolve? You know, sort of, let me, if I can use the term, is there a learning involved? Uh, is, is there some sort of evolution that happens? So let me take, a, take a, a stab at this very, these are very difficult questions. Uh, the first one um, of how did I, for instance, feel drawn to this? How did this sensitivity or sensibility about some quality in an, in an artistic work, a painting in this case, develop in me? You know, and I'm reminded of a conversation in the late 80s uh, that I had on this subject with someone, Naman, that you've certainly read his books. You must have known him during your SOAS days, Mark Zabrowski. Yes. Who yes. had one of the yes. most fantastic eyes, as we say in, the, in, in this world, uh, and was a great scholar. He and Bob Alderman, I used, every time I went on a business trip to London, I would spend at least have a meal with them and of course, uh, Mark would tempt me some great painting or the other, and he's been a, was a great contributor to this collection. So this question came, and uh, you know, I said, "Well," uh, and in in the middle of the conversation, he blurted out something, which I never forgot because I had not dared to have that thought. He said, "Gursharan, you were just born with the eye; you just had the taste." And that made me think back to my childhood. And, you know, when I was four or five years old or something, uh, there was an aunt who used to embroider. You know, it was kind of a thing for women to do, young women to do. And I would be there, I used to paint in watercolors just for fun. At four, you know, the paintings were rather often at uh, that age. But I would jump in and say, no, those colors don't work. So maybe, Mark was right, and but at the same time, one shouldn't be discouraged by such thoughts. You know, those who others should not be discouraged. I certainly had an instinctive draw to certain works of art. Now, the second part, it's interesting that uh, Elvira and I have lived through what can be referred to as the golden age of collecting Indian paintings. You know, with the with, with independence, the Maharajas lost their tremendous sources of revenue, collecting taxes on trade, etc. And they had to live their lives differently. And the huge amassed things, jewels and other treasures and paintings too, which they treasured, eventually had to go out and be sold. Not very different from what European royalty and nobility had to do in previous centuries, you know, from the Napoleonic Wars and that period. Uh, so these things were flowing through London and through New York prior to sort of the Export Controls Acts and whatnot. And we were able to see a flood of things. And when the best advice I can give to collectors is you must build up your mental reservoir of aspect that you can then bring to bear when a work is put in front of you. It's the skill of looking, remembering, correlating things in the mind. And by the way, this is not very different from what we do in my own profession, the world of technology. We learn things from all over the place. And when a problem is presented, it is that interconnection that one finds that sparks something. And so, yes, there has been much to learn. And I'm very thankful to all kinds of scholars, some still around, others who have passed on to the afterlife if such a thing exists. And the various museums, institutions, private collections, I saw a lot of stuff. So you end up getting prepared for when the opportunity shows itself.
And that's, I think, how it works. I don't know if I addressed your question fully, but it's a question one can spend hours on. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, this whole thing about nature, nurture, and how much do you keep nurturing your, your, your collecting habit? I mean, that's what I was trying to get at, is that- Okay, so that I didn't address. Actually, Naman, we have hardly ever parted with a painting. And mm -hmm. I'll give you a strange answer for that. Elvira and I weren't really, really, really wealthy. Mm -hmm. We did really well, but we didn't have the kind of extraordinary wealth at the prices that were being demanded to just buy and reject. Mm -hmm. And perhaps because of this sensitivity that I had and Elvira developed and we developed, we really didn't buy things that we felt have become wallpaper. They stayed alive for us. Right. Some things we gave to museums because we really wanted them to encourage showing them, studying them, et cetera. Uh, but pretty much uh, everything we have acquired has stayed with us. A very, very minor percentage really has gone away. And it's all still exciting. Wow, mm -hmm. long answer. No, thanks. So yes, I mean, I think it's, it, it answers my question that I think um, exposure and do, that does help develop what one acquires, um, develop taste, um, and you keep, insights keep coming from the material itself. And that uh, helps you acquire things that fulfill that curiosity as time goes on. Quite um, right. I, Shall I, I move on? Sure. You'll have to cue me, by the way. So oh, okay. So so let's see let's see the 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 next picture. I I wanted to say that you know one of the criteria by which people used to collect earlier used to be to build up representative examples of different schools and different periods of Indian painting or Indian art, and things were always driven by fulfilling these checkboxes of a certain taxonomy that used to exist. And a lot of the art history was itself concerned with presenting material in a way where the big question to be asked of the material, the great riddle was, where was this made? And when was it made? Does it belong to Mewad or does it belong to Marwad or does it belong to whichever school? Um, those became the kind of burning questions and that's what art history was concerned with. Do you think we've reached some kind of closure on that, on that vein of scholarship? Uh, I wouldn't say a complete closure is there because mm -hmm. we keep learning all kinds of things over time. But by and large, the evolution from the great British interest in imperial works, you know, the Mughal works, the Sultanate period, et cetera, which, probably resonated with their own colonial uh, vision of themselves. Uh, that morphed further into the Rajput schools uh, because you know, the Rajputs were sort of the inheritors of what they had learned from the Mughals. But more interestingly, uh, over the times as that flood of paintings emerged from small principalities that could not maintain ateliers of artists some rather striking things emerged that had a different aesthetic sense. And the picture we are looking at here is an example of this. Uh, I'm pretty sure hardly anybody in the audience with a few exceptions of uh, uh, diehards like myself have ever heard of a place called Sita Mao. And you know, uh, I'm sure many have gone pretty close to it while taking the trains to Mumbai from Delhi because Ratalan is not very far and it's a big junction, which also, by the way, produce rather dramatic paintings. Uh, so we have learned a tremendous amount. I think, Naman, you want to talk about this painting. It's one of my well, absolute I, favorites. Yes, I, it's, <laughs> well, I adored it from the minute I saw it. I thought it was so wonderful. I, I think it's a picture that, you know, it, it opens up so many ways of, in which we can now start thinking about looking at Indian art from all kinds of other perspectives. I mean, here is a Maharaja's beloved dog. Um, and I think the scale of the dog immediately tells us who or what is so important. And um, I was always struck that the keeper carries a feather 
um, with which to train or control the dog, not some whip or stick. And, um, and then it's all set in this sort of season of Basant and springtime joy in the background. And it shows a kind, a kind of priorities and an affection which the dog's human companion obviously wants to have recorded. Uh, and, uh, Naman, um, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, I just realized as I'm looking at the image that it is not really a feather. Uh, yeah. What is it then? It, you know those reeds that grow that develop that uh, puffy thing off? Yes, I know it very well. It's a, it's a grass, it's uh -huh. on the top of the panda. Mm -hmm. In Punjabi, they're called kana. Right. Okay, but they're very soft. Yes. So your main point is correct. But also notice the dog seems to be sniffing at the flowers on the bush. Yes, indeed. Which, which is not coincidental. It's intentional, in my opinion. Of course, right. And the little butterfly underneath near the bush, and even little lower on that front, there is some sort of a cricket sitting. Yes. <laughs> there it is, yes. I and can see that. Please uh, go ahead. I mean, I, I just couldn't resist jumping in. No, but my point was you know, not just the mood of the painting, but the fact that we are learning about these kinds of, of small tikanas and centers. So we're still expanding what we knew of so, so many um, uh, centers of painting. And the interesting thing is that we're combining it with a study of the oeuvre of specific biographies of individual artists and how those artists might have adapted and changed their style when they were at a different point in their career working for a different patron. And this is bringing up a lot more complexity into the, into the narrative of Indian painting today than we had previously accounted for when we used to teach the subject or present the subject, which was always conditioned by um, an overly simplified trajectory of presenting them in these little groups of, of styles and what epitomized a style at a particular period. And I think those, those compartments have now been pretty much destabilized because there's always and this and that and the other which is happening at the same time in each of those places. And we can't sit back thinking that the taxonomy of Indian art history for Indian painting has been done. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, look, uh, there's one more little point that I think uh, I should, should throw in here. We have to also look at the artists themselves. We know yeah. scant little about artists from the, these uh, small principalities. This guy, his name is Swarup Ram, the artist. Right. Does he perceive himself? He perceives himself as being a poet. Because the inscription on the back of this painting says, Likhyo, I, it's sort of scary. Kaam kiyo, Mass, I mean, basically that it took him two months to make the painting, first of all, which tells you something about the effort in producing such a work. And then he says, Likhyo Kavi Swarupra. He sees himself as a poet. And then he says, let this be auspicious. And he puts a picture of two elephants on the back of this painting. So th this is very near the beginning of work. Was he living in Sita Mao? Was he an itinerant artist? We don't know any of that. My own hunch is probably these artists took commissions in various places, just as artists did in Florence. Sorry, I, I had to inter interject that. Right. Shall we so, move on? Yeah, please, let's move on. I mean, this comparison with Florence is quite interesting because you're saying like, just as we study migrating artists and groups in Renaissance Europe, where yeah. we look at the movement of ateliers, we should try and use a similar methodology when we're looking at the migration and movement of artists over here, perhaps. Yep. Well, so, like, this is another interesting one. I mean, um, you know, again, I mean, what do we know about 
all these sampradays that might have been active in the Deccan, um, which were producing, or sansthans, different sansthans that were producing these pictures in the Deccan. Um, tell us about this. You know, th there is a manuscript of the Ramayana, mm -hmm. which uh, is supposed to be in the Andhra um, State Archives or Museum, and it has been published by Jagdish Mittal many, many uh, decades ago. And, uh, you know, somehow, way, way back, two folios from that uh, left, you know, these things were molding and I'm sure somebody or the other kind of tossed them or took them out. And one is with Jagdish Mittal, and this one used to be with Stuart Carey Welch, the great art historian uh, whose collection is at Harvard, uh, a major part of it. And uh, I was fascinated by it when I saw it in an exhibition at the Asia Society. I knew, I had no inkling of how great painting in South India was until I saw this. Yeah. And I don't think I can put into words what attracts me to this picture. The line is, of course, beautifully flowing. There's so much movement. And as you see, the battle is ongoing. The facing page is with Jagadish Mittal, which is Ravan on his chariot. And here is Ram on the chariot, which was supplied to him, by the way, towards the end of the Ramayana uh, battle. And you see all the bodies of uh, the Vanars, et cetera, who have fallen in the battle, uh, who will be revived by Indra after Ram's victory. But somehow this artist has engaged with the myth, the story, at least to me, a Sikh, it is a myth, uh, that to many is really history. And he has brought it to a point where as you see it, you feel the action happening. And that to me signifies a great work. The color is used in a subtle way. The arrows are flying all over. Of course, I don't really imagine anybody could shoot so many arrows, but it's a metaphor here to make us feel the ferocity of the action between two great warriors. Uh, one who we know is a god, but he doesn't. This is sort of one of these great enigmas. Ram is Vishnu incarnate in the story, but he himself doesn't know because Ravan had been promised that he could not be killed by a god. So Ram had to be a human, yet he's using weapons given to him by gods. Uh, this, it is such a wonderful story uh, that, you know, its depth is known to few in my opinion, but its breadth is known to millions and billions all mm. over Asia and increasingly all over the world. And this picture is one of the finest that I have found, even though it has its moth-eaten pieces are missing. Uh, it just thrills us every time we see it. What do you see, Naman? Well, I, I picked it up not because I selected it because not just because of its iconographic precision, but because it opens up a canon of visual, visual of, of visualization in uh, in Indian art, in Indian painting, that we don't normally account for. Because when we talk about the histories and chronologies and lineages of Indian painting, we are um, so fixated on what happens with the broader network of what happens in North India with the progression from the Jain and the Sultanate interpenetration of styles and how it moves into the Mughal court with Akbar amassing his atelier, and then its dispersal with Aurangzeb and then the coming up of the Rajput styles of painting and so on. But, but hold on, there are other things that are happening in Assam, in the Deccan. Um, there are things happening in Paitan on the walls of Lepakshi. There are, there's the whole tradition of Sri Kalahasti and its paintings that are happening in Andhra at this time. There are all these others that are happening simultaneously, which can't just be dismissed as being other and incidental if you're writing a history today. Um, 
you can't keep perpetuating the same um, categorization that we had previously, we had been educated on, for instance. Um, you, know, you know, Naman, I went to college in South India at IIT, then called Madras. It's still called IIT Madras, now in Chennai. Hmm. And it opened my eyes. Uh, in those days, I used to like to bicycle a lot. And I actually bicycled to Mahabalipuram from IIT. And it was mind blowing. You know, all these houses that run along that highway now didn't exist then. It was the beach, the coconut palms, and then you've happened upon those great, great sculptures. And then traveling in South India, I suddenly realized something. And as I have been working on my book, uh, which fortunately I was doing while this, when this COVID thing started happening and I've been able to make tremendous progress with about 60, 70 essays already. Uh, I started realizing that much that people sing about in the North was not invented in the North. The entire Bhakti movement, including Krishna Bhakti, came from South India. The Sangam poetry that started in the South, in the courts of the Deep South, um, I wasn't aware of it, you know. Maybe it was the sort of the lack of depth of my education. I certainly went to a convent school in Delhi and they were telling us more about hedgehogs and primroses than about things relevant to India. Uh, and uh, then how the worship of the baby Krishna, that great business of Vatsalya, Bhav and of Madhurya Bhav grew in the south with those saint, uh, saints and emerged again in Sanskrit form after they had gone to the natural languages. And I became acutely aware of the Bala Gopala Stuti the, by Bilva Mangala Leela Sukh because I discovered series of paintings. And I'll right. show you those in a moment. Right. Uh, that mm. this whole log jam of the North sort of busts open wide and mm. much of Hinduism as it is practiced in the North, in Mathura, in Vrindavan, in, in the temples there, it really originates in the South. And it in turn was a reaction to the strength of the Jains and the Buddhists in the South, you know, the counter movement there. There's much that, you know, my engagement with the Indian paintings has led me to learn. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over, but this painting sort of opened the front gates. As a category, I mean, I, mean, I noticed that none of us, you or I have been chatting and we've never used the word miniature once in our conversation. And um, do, you, do you think the word miniature is a restricting nomenclature as we put up on the screen? Well, let me be very blunt. I am hyper allergic to its use. Right. Because, because uh, it is perceived by most as diminishing, uh, you know, miniature, tiny, uh, you know. You don't it, think it has anything to do with minium? Exactly, as you pointed out the other day. But you know, let's, let's be a little bit fair about this. There are two kinds of paintings, at least from India. Those that come from the manuscript tradition, which really are not meant to be perceived from a distance or hung on a wall or something like that. And so, you know, they are in fact things that the artist worked on with the eyes, maybe three or four or five inches away from the paper using tiny, tiny brushes, making strokes that take a microscope to see for most of us, certainly with my eyesight. And then there are paintings like this one. On cloth, it is substantial in size. Uh, by the way, this was essentially given to me by someone you probably got to know in London, Toby Falk. A few months before he passed away, he didn't tell me he was uh, he had cancer and was dying, but we had a last cup of tea. And he just, as I had my limo waiting for to take me to the airport, and he 
hands me this roll and says, Gurshan, look at this when you're on the plane. Uh, I did pay him for it, but it just blew my mind. The moment I opened it on the plane, I'm sure people around me must have thought I was a lunatic. And it took me in a dire direction of thinking, uh, which I'll share right now and then we can expand on later. This painting I concluded was not made for a male patron. Who would be interested in a picture of drunken women? I mean, oh, I as, as a male find that aspect just of minimal interest. And it got me thinking of the, of the princesses in the Zenana who came from cultured backgrounds who had money, they were given estates. They would have commissioned these. And I passed that on to other serious scholars like you in those days. And I'm very happy to note that all kinds of studies looking at the archives in Mewar, finding payments made by the Maharani's two artists, painters started emerging and there's a whole genre of painting done for them. This is such a painting, it's not a miniature. The painting hanging behind me on the wall is not a miniature. You can't put it in a pendant or a locket, which is what- No, you can't. And in fact, there are certain paintings that we will come to um, which require viewing distance. And that immediately takes it away from the category of being a manuscript illustration. And so they're not illustrations alone. And some of these need not have been made for courtly patrons at all. And in fact, some of them have been made for uh, in a devotional context or might have been owned by patrons in libraries who were um, merchants. We also know about that. We will, we will see some of those. And so I don't think the category of court art is also a very uh, befitting category. Now, coming back to the fact that who is this painting made for? I mean, and you, you said that perhaps it's made for um, uh, a female patron because of the subject matter, but equally, one could interpret this that it could be have been made very much for a male patron. But I'm gonna pick up on that point uh, a couple of paintings later. I'm gonna come back to this issue about uh, whose gaze is it, is it catering to? Um, a lot of these paintings are suffused with a kind of symbolic vocabulary. And one needs to be um, sufficiently educated in knowing what the symbolism is trying to communicate. It's like rather like a grammar um, for knowing what the painter is trying to communicate. So moving away from form and style and nomenclature of the discipline, I want to talk about how painters were always picking up motifs and treating them as symbolic reference, composing them in ways that force us to understand how visual communication or iconography says things that sometimes words are not permitted to or don't make that much of. While at times, on the other hand, we find paintings that are almost just literal illustrations of the written word, um, doing little more than what the poet had already suggested. Now, I find when does the balance tip when the artist is doing something that is not really there in the poetry where he's using visual symbolism to be able to drive a point home, which you will get if you look at the painting long enough. And I think this is one of my favorite paintings that makes that kind of, of uh, point very clearly. Um, Gursharan, tell us about what's happening in this picture. Well, um... It is also Elvira's and my in the list of favorites. You know, this whole business of favorite becomes very hard. You're right. Okay. Uh, when I saw an image of this painting, uh, I initially responded to the softness. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful painting, no matter which parameter you bring to bear on it. A gorgeous landscape of a river, a river flowing by the lake, by the mountains, 
a dark looming sky, a certain kind of mood and passion there in the chamber, very sumptuous, all kinds of gold objects with uh, which one can explore and should. Uh, but there's this bed on which pillows are arranged. And then there is this couple and it became mysterious. What is going on? Well, we know it's an amorous scene. It's a private scene. His arm is around her shoulders. They're both dressed to the nines in a particular way, though you know it's a, his upper body is bare. Um, she is, um, he is sort of stretching his arms out. And as we will see in a detail, he is pulling the drawstring on her pants. And she is covering his eyes. So mm. these symbols that the artist has harnessed with a subtlety and a gentleness about a beautiful moment to come and evolving in front of our eyes is of both shyness and passion emerging, blossoming, growing. C can you show us the details? Yes, I will. Yeah. How you can perceive it. But you know, funnily, we did not see all that right away. And this is an important thing to learn about these paintings. They have a certain quality that fills your eyes immediately. Mm -hmm. And you stop seeing. Mm. And you have to over time train yourself to keep on looking. And then the picture slowly reveals its secrets to you. This is the biggest advice I give to any beginners in the field, any students who are studying this, etc. We have paintings we've had for 30 years. We take them out, we look at them, we find something we didn't spot. Mm. Not surprising, the artist was working at close quarters. But here you see it. She is really beautiful. Well, he's got this golden drawstring falling over his crotch, and he's undoing her drawstring, which has got a tassel at the end of it. Yes. But the, the other thing is, uh, is the motif of the drawstring is picked up in the center of the picture, yep. which is a curtain that has been drawn up in the entire frame is pulled up to be able to show you the world that looks beyond once the, once the curtain is lifted, once the drawstring has been, uh, uh, when the blind has been opened as it were. And it's, if you go back to the full picture, uh, one can actually see that that motif of the drawstring hanging in the middle of the painting, uh, holding the blind up, falling precisely over the landscape is an exact referent to what the picture is really all about. It's about opening up this vista um, that, that we're going to see. So, and it's about seeing and concealing um, and only if you know how to see the vista, as it were, what will the shy bride allow you to really see it? And I thought that was an immediate poetic reference to, to a, you know, a very amusing painting about Anada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it makes you think about these this idea that we must start looking more closely at what the painter is trying to do in each picture. Um, can we move on to the next? No, no, hold on. There's this, yeah. uh, since you mentioned the nada, let yeah. me tell you something interesting. Yeah. You know, naughty teenage boys in mm. Punjab mm. were not allowed to really tease the young women you know, they'd get beat up in the marketplace. But they would do subtle things like they would softly say to a girl walking by, Penji, Nara Sambalo. 
basically saying, sister, please take care of your drawstring, which is hanging outside. Okay, it, a reference, a sexual reference that they thought was defensible, but I'm sure the young lady uh, was uh, embarrassed. So that's kind of the uh, bad boy use of the same metaphor. Here, of course, it's, it's a much more subtle thing. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could help bring that memory out again. Okay, here we are. This is so, where you want to go. I, I, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about some of these pictures which are um, showing romance and it's romance for a certain consumption, for a certain kind of audience. And it's about casting yourself. I mean, here is a portrait of a prince who has cast himself in a certain mood, in a certain space. And the more you look at this prince, he is dressed in a manner which is a little effeminate. Um, his turban is rather floppy and interesting in the way that it is arranged. His mustache is very slight. His eyes are picked out in coal. But most startling of all are, is the jewelry. Um, I'm not that concerned about the pale pink scarf around his neck or something like that. But I'm I'm concerned about the fact. I, I noticed the fact that there are these large hooped earrings, which are generally not worn by men. Um, and you have masculine necklaces and pendants and so on, but not quite always in this manner. Um, and in amongst all of this, you see the pose that he strikes, where he's holding on to the branch of a tree in a very classic pose of a naika. And this is a, a tradition of iconography that has lasted for, um, in the romantic poetry, in the genre of romantic poetry for thousands of years. And we've seen it on temple walls, and we've seen it on Buddhist monuments, and then we see it even in contemporary cinema, where the same thing is invoked, or in modern Indian cinema, where the same poses were struck whenever there were allusions to romance uh, or the seasons, and the same tropes were being re-invoked. And so you, you think about why is it that this prince is casting himself in this particular manner? And um, I, I wondered, whether you had observed these kinds of things, because the whole painting is filled with, with romance. The pair of deer, the doe and the gazelle looking at each other, the peacock and peahen, the little pairs of birds, the little partridges sitting by his feet, and so on. All over the pictures, there are, there are these pairs. Um, I, I wonder if you had noticed something unusual about his attire. I, you know, certainly this, uh a uh, particular painting um, makes one explore the kinds of questions that you have brought up. Um, you know, to my mind, the notions of sexuality in India are not as binary as uh, certainly Victorian, uh, British and uh, Western kind of Judeo-Christian domains uh, have made them. Uh, you know, as we talked about Madhurya Bhav, mm -hmm. a person, whether male or female, approaches the Lord as a lover. Mm -hmm. And that love, even though you're not supposed to be prurient about it, gazillions of paintings, actually depict it as conjugal. A male would approach the god, Krishna in particular, as though he were a female himself. So this uh, non-binary notion is not uh, such a startling thing in my mind of whether you're looking at poetry or sculpture or wherever in India. Now, when I looked at it, certainly, you know, that's a possibility that one could explore, but I had a different Punjabi word come to my mind when I saw it, 
Munda Bada Banka hai. Right. You know the term Banka? Yes, I mean, it's used across in Braj poetry as well. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, the turban which you commented on is uh, fairly widely used uh, in that region and even in images, etc., at Ranjit Singh's court. And there was nothing uh, non binary about Ranjit Singh mm -hmm. uh, um, and his, his courtiers. Uh, it was there. So I didn't read into it what you did. It just it was in a particular fashion. Right. So even, I, I, even I the under turban didn't do it. Uh, the color of his uh, churidar mm -hmm. and his turban to me spoke of passion. And right. the poem that we have there, actually of longing, mm. is, is what the poem is about that, that is written on there, mm. on the back. Mm. Uh, so it, it was sort of, to me, th that sort of a thing. I did observe the Shala Bhanjika related things and the birds and the animals. But, you know, this is a character whose uh, uh, basically scope of activity is hugely diminished because effectively the British are there mm -hmm. and uh, he's just having fun in his little tiny hill, hill state. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe he was running around engaging in peccadillos and, but this painting certainly was not one that he was going around exhibiting, you know, as most of these paintings were for his personal. And quite right, I mean, those aspects could be there, but they didn't kind of turn my head around and say, hey, yeah, no. But that's exactly what I wanted to come to, what, what you've just raised, that I think we have to pay a lot of attention and a lot more research needs to be done onto the richness of the context, because it's all too easy to approach these issues when we are writing histories from our contemporary concerns without actually giving enough attention to whether those were the same concerns that were existing in that society and at that time. And how context specific do we need to be, for instance, with the entire tradition of the Haridas Sampradaya that began to promote the idea of the Sakibha. Um, we know that, that it was for characters to be cast in the manner of longing um, to be able to develop that um, was not considered in any way um, uh, a dent in their notion of masculinity. But at the same time, um, we do have to think about the parallel con context where you have the rise of the Khalsa, which does not have this kind of a tradition within it, which is cheek by jowl with this version of poetic context. And you, you are seeing the, the same painters and the same people moving between these two worlds, um, living beside each other. And so I think the requirement to be able to complicate the period's history um, has to be done with adequate research and without forcing the, the narrative of our contemporary concerns to read into the past, what we want to make of it. Right. And, and I think that's the portion that I wanted to bring out when, when we're looking at pictures like this. I, by the way, had a go at reading the poem at the back. And um, I, I did manage to, you'd given me a few lines, but I managed to read the rest. And it is quite interesting because um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's clearly a lyric to be sung. I'm not going to read it out because I think we're gonna run out of time otherwise. But I think we, are, um, we do need to, to, to see that these are also books that are accompanied with recitation. Um, so uh, anyway, let's carry on. Um, yeah. we, I, I, Shugata, are you there? Shugata, are you there to tell us that we are running out of time? I was about to, but Anu just posted a text, do not stop them, they are fantastic. So I leave it on to you to decide. Shugata, I what. think we should continue. The fun is yet to come. Right. <laughs> I, I thought the Nara was Come on, let's, let's move quicker. <laughs> okay, so um, this, this kind of a theme then carries on with some of the other pictures, which are really quite startling, like this particular picture. Is it Kali, Shakti, or is it Shiv, or is it an Ardhanarishwar? And have we ever seen anything like it before? Have we seen anything which has small breasts, a feminine face, but on a hirsute body? 
which complicates our assessment of the figure's gender. Um, iconographically too, the figure possesses qualities of both Shiv and Shakti. The nudity alludes more to an ascetic than to depictions of Shiv and Shakti. However, the forearms make it clear that this is no mortal that we are looking at. And I think this um, really does um, provoke one to, to think about how these things are being redefined in each age, how these ideas are being redefined for the particular to be able to deliver them with the punch that they have, they are meant to have. The concept is meant to, to take you into a non-binary understanding of divinity. And the, uh, the, 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 the artist is trying to reinvent the iconography for that or adapt the iconography for that in a particular context in Mandi in the 18th century. Um, so I, I, that's the reason why I selected that. Now, um, I was saying that apart from looking at these extraordinary things um, and issues of what school, what style, what date, being a continuing concern in the field, but paintings like the one that you're showing us now really challenge us to reconsider the intention behind some of these pictures, how they were used or how were they seen or when were they seen? Um, when I first saw this particular painting at your house, I, I was astonished by the skill of its execution. And I found that one required a certain viewing distance from the picture. It, you couldn't really appreciate, I mean, on a slide, it looks marvelous because it's been reduced in size and we've got the effect of the viewing distance. We don't need to necessarily appreciate it in the detail. Um, to be able to get its visual impact. And these are not pictures that are made for holding in the hand, which is the general discourse for how we understand how Indian paintings functioned. So if there are paintings that are being made that you have to step several feet away from, that makes you certainly open your um, idea, open up the idea of what Indian paintings were doing, how they were being used. Um, tell us about this picture. Yeah, well, we, we are sort of short on time, so I'm going to uh, move a little bit quickly. This is one of the most uh, surprising and phenomenal works that Elvira and I have found in our long collecting career. And, uh, you know, you look at it, it's certainly edgy. Uh, she uh, is quite reassured you see her as someone quite clever, uh, self and more than just self-assured. And the question immediately comes, who is she? Now, this question has uh, been asked again and again uh, by at least two uh, very well-known art historians have then opined on it. And it is not only illustrative, but a little amusing to see what conclusions they came to. And it's sort of illustrative of what uh, those of you who've read Mary Beard have uh, seen the admonition that uh, it is seductive to blur the boundaries between lifelike image and real life flesh. So, you know, your own impressions, you bring them to bear on the picture and you draw conclusions. So let me share some of them with you. The two art historians, both of them looking at this picture because of two things that Buffant hat she's wearing of a Portuguese design uh, and the fact that she's frontally looking at you. Up front concluded, this is a Firangi, a foreigner. So once they made up that mind, then they had to spin their wheels to fit their notion into this picture. So I will just, instead of taking a lot of time, uh, tell you what they concluded. And I have to read it because I can't remember it verbatim. Stuart Carey Welch published the drawing on the left which is in the National Museum in New Delhi in, as the cover picture of 
one of his great exhibitions, and he was one of the great estates, and he titled it The Van. <laughs> okay? And he says, this sultry, slow-eyed beauty must have been particularly admired by the Maharaja who commissioned her portrait. Okay. He doesn't stop there. He goes on, and let me find the exact quote, because these are very, very illustrative. He says... Revealing about the mindset. I'm actually reading from his catalog. Okay. Okay. Cool. I'm saying, he says, usually Mughal or Mughal-inspired portraits of women show them in profile. First of all, that's bullshit. Okay. I'm sorry, Stuart, you're dead, so you can't argue with me, but it's nonsense because I show in my essay dozens of examples of Islamic paintings where the women are looking at you and they are not vamps, okay? Uh, probably because a frontal view implied all too audacious friendliness on the part of the sitter. In Rajput art too, it seems that ladies, as opposed to women, did not face anyone other than their husbands or other members of their families. The fact that our van, look at the conclusions, is shown full face suggests that she was of lowly morals, i.e. a dancing girl or courtesan, or simply playing at being a European, which no decent person would have done. My God. Okay, someone I admired greatly went to such extents because he could not reconcile his own sexual perceptions with this image. Right. Okay. So, yeah. you know, you have to be very careful in not bringing your baggage when you look at pictures. What yeah. has happened in my opinion here, and then I'll tell you about the other art historian who's just much milder, but still interesting, is that a drawing evolved into a painting and the artist has gone and played with it. And this happens in India, it happens everywhere. Modern artists are doing it today, riffing on paintings, making them their own. And this has actually been done here. The eyebrows have joined, the mouth has changed, subtle things, the hat has become more bouffant. Uh, all of these things, are intentional on the part of the artist who's playing with this picture. So I had to do a tremendous amount of detective work because one art historian looked at our painting in the context of writing about another painting and said that this is a dear friend, a very distinguished art historian, wow. Kathy Glynn, looking at a painting in the Mittal Museum said, this beguiling sister, uh, sitter, sorry, may be an actual individual foreigner in Rajasthan. I think she was very intelligent to say maybe, okay? She goes on to suggest that the strikingly beautiful foreign woman was indeed a European visitor to the Mewar court, possibly a member of Ketelar's retinue in 1711. So you see a very interesting, narrative is generated here. Kathy Glenn happens to be the preeminent scholar of the stipple style of painting at Mewar done in this period. And so, you know, like me, when she has a hammer in her hand, she sees a nail and so do I. So, you know, this happens and we have to be cautious. So what did I do? First of all, I decided to see if these were made by the same artist. Fortunately, Milo Beach had, uh, the great scholar Milo Cleveland Beach had a close up of the drawing on the left and I took a close up of our painting. And as you look at the brush strokes, this is the detective work I was sort of mentioning earlier to Shugata. Uh, you see, indeed, it is very likely the same hand at work. As you look, for instance, uh, to the left of the left eye, uh, you see the brush strokes, etc. But then the question is, who is the artist? And there we had another breakthrough. Thanks again to Milo giving me 
a very close detail of an extremely famous painting of a rhinoceros hunt on the right and our painting on the left. And you start finding that the use of cross hatching brush strokes is the hallmark of this artist. And this is not an artist at Mewar. This is one of the great Kota masters who's been given the name uh, Artist A by Milo Beach, who's the expert on Kota painting. So to my mind, what is this? I think when the flood of European prints arrived, being brought into India, starting in the reign of Akbar, in the 1580s, some European print arrived. The artists were challenged by Akbar and Jahangir earlier. And then this tradition probably then became embedded in the Rajput courts uh, to copy them. And we have plenty of examples of such superb copies to show how masterful their artists were. And this probably is something derived from a print my conjecture, a little bit more benign than the assumptions of uh, Kerry Welch uh, and others. So here is how detective games go. So mm. I'll, in the interest of time, Naman, I think I'll just start yeah. moving for that. This yeah. painting showed up. Mm. Wow, what an enigma. It was, of course, very uh, demanding visually. And Veera and I avidly acquired it. Um, but the questions were just endless. By examining the sky and various technical aspects, it appeared that this painting was made in the state of Kishangarh uh, in the period of great uh, outburst of creativity after the death of Aurangzeb in 1706 in these Rajput courts. But was this something somebody imagined? Uh, how did this happen there? And that became a pretty demanding thing for me to figure out. Well, Google came to the rescue on the first question, whether this where it was. See my question, Venice, is it Venice? Well, there's the building that's in the painting. It is the head of the Dominican order in Venice, uh, named after uh, St. John and Paul, not the apostles, uh, commonly called Sani Polo. Very important. Um, the statue next to it, if you see in the photograph, is, was made by Andrea del Verrocchio. Uh, but the Indian artist who somehow became aware of this has certainly eliminated the statue. The statue was there when the painting was made. We know that. We know its date is in the 1400s. Uh, but when you have time to compare, you realize this is precisely the same place. But how did that artist get to this? That mystery started being unraveled when somebody gave a lecture here in Seattle, somebody from the Getty Institute, uh, Francis Turpak, talking about uh, optical devices found in the summer palace in Beijing such as this one known as a zoogroscope, a biconvex lens with a mirror behind it that would be used the way you see this little boy in the picture below, where the important thing was they would get a sense of depth because they would get sort of a bifocal vision from the two eyes looking through that lens, seeing the reflected image. So the search for a print that motivated the painting started and guess what? To a great surprise, here is the print made for a zoogroscope, naming the same place that showed up. And if you compare it with the painting, there are differences. Certainly a palm tree wasn't growing in Venice. Uh, there is a man with a sword over his shoulder over here wearing Mughal attire well, he could have gone to Venice, but unlikely. Uh, so this painting really is made in India, there are oxen and whatnot. And that's how these mysteries are resolved. Now, Kerry Welch had owned the painting, which he had titled Versailles with no basis. 
just mm. imagination, the gardens of Venice, it was a brilliant idea. But I suspect now it's from the same, this series of paintings, we have found five or six uh, paintings that there must be a print for it. And right. whoever owns that, which is the Fog Museum, should look for it in their vast holdings. Mm. So this is how the game goes. You have to look and look and look and piece things together. The way we do it in science, this is the same thing. Naman, I'll just charge ahead. Please do, yes. Okay, you had alluded to something very important. And I am eagerly awaiting the book you're writing on the uh, evolution in, in the, you know, the Sultanate period on into painting and art in the West. I don't know when I'm going to turn it into a book, but I, I have long dreamt of turning it at least into a full-time MA course at the uh, university. So I, I hope I get around to doing that one day. Uh, that would be a good start for the book. <laughs> Well, you sent me a very intriguing PowerPoint uh, yes. that I think is very nice. Now, I had been deeply looking into this too, you know, as I mentioned, Bilva Mangal and all that, and our own Jain pictures, and started seeing something important, which is that in Western India, in the long 15th century, as uh, historians call it, starting probably in the later 1300s, going into the 15, sorry, 1600, 1500s, yes, 1600s, now into the 1500s, that's about a little over 140 years, something interesting happened. The sultans needed money lenders and business, people who could manage money. The Jains were the experts at that and at trade. They were located on the trade route. They let them do their thing as long as the Jains did not interfere with matters of state. And so the Jain merchants and others were able to commission unbelievably beautiful paintings such as this one uh, from, which is really not from exactly that region, but we have very similar things. This is from uh, Jaunpur, another Sultanate where the Sultans were they knew they had to look after their bankers because when they needed money for anything, these are the people they turned to. And these are in the manuscript tradition. And here's another one, which is very curious. Uh, no one has figured out the manuscript. I have worked intensely on it. And it is actually a representation of the site of Shatrunjaya. In the top left corner, you see the five uh, Pandavas and the mother Kunti. Uh, because there is such a shrine there. This maps onto the shrines at Shatranjaya. So this is from some kind of a Mahatmya that was uh, used for, again, commissioned by a Jain merchant. Here's another dramatic thing which uh, we were lucky to acquire many years ago fr from a scene of a cable gyan of a Jain uh, uh, Jinnah and the celebrations where the celestials have descended to earth to celebrate this, this painting keeps getting borrowed for exhibits. It's going off again to Cincinnati and the Asian Art Museum. One day we'll have to say no. Uh, but the important point is these were being made to be used when the Jain monks would rest during the rainy season, teach the younger Jain acolytes and the community would come and they would show these images and the manuscripts, recite the content, et cetera. And the same artists, it was interesting to discover, started making Krishna Bhakti images uh, in the same region. Now, who were they making them for? Well, there were Marwadi merchants there. They intermarried with the Jain. The Jains would, revere Krishna also. And so here is a page from a Balagopala Stuti. The projecting eyes are the same as a Jain manuscript. The trees look the same. These artists also made things for the sultans, of, as we know from the Jainas Shahname. So there's a tradition of taking the abstraction of Indian paintings that has been evolved beautifully mm. and, and, and harnessing it. So Naman, you were going to say something about but, this. Uh, yes, this, that abstraction that takes place in these paintings, 
reveals a language that communicates in a manner that isn't always being done by words. Now, I'd alluded to this right at the beginning of our talk today. And um, this forces us to see paintings as communicators, not just of stories uh, that can be sensed through language, but in ways that allow us to sense feeling or meaning through line and color and movement instead to be able to look at the language of painting itself. So painters could illustrate a text, however, they could equally interpret a text. And they could also do things within with their medium, which was line, color, and form. Now, these are things which the poet or the writer could not necessarily. Um, we already know about the problems when we talk about what happens in translation, when you are translating not from one language into another, but from one whole medium of communication into another medium of communication, which will naturally bring shifts in how we perceive material. And I think that's something that I feel lies at the heart of the iconographic systems that lie in, in, within Indian painting, which lie encoded in Indian painting. So these dramatic um, abstractions of space, line, color, uh, block background sometimes, distortions, um, it's been often repeated with regard to the way in which landscapes are projected, but I think it happens in many subtle ways constantly through a visual vocabulary which is consistent and which allows us to make very strong connections with the world of Indian, of Indian sculpture um, as well, where uh, sculpture has many of the same metaphors which are encoded within it. Um, I, I, I particularly love this picture for its buildup and dra dramatic line and color, the texture, the play with the form, which is so necessary to be able to bring individuality uh, or uniqueness to each telling of a tale, tales which would have been so common that everyone would have known the story. So why are you going to be interested in looking at yet another manuscript with the same picture, with the same story? And the fact that every iteration can reinterpret that story is, is something that has to be understood. Um, I mean, I think this is just such a splendid detail in what it communicates. Um, so I, I think what has been of concern to me in terms of understanding how to start reading these pictures has been, apart from the connections with the longer history of sculpture and so on, it's been to be able uh, to be able particularly to look at Ragamala pictures. Yeah, before we move on, uh, hmm. I wanted uh, my dear friend Deepthi to look at this, especially. Uh, it, I was immediately reminded of Raza's uh, compositions on Bindu. Uh, and my feeling has been for a long time that abstraction was uh, at the core of Indian paintings going back to the 1300s, at least with the Jain paintings. And here is a superb example of that. And in, you know, uh, this really draws Elvira and me to this form of art. Uh, mm. No wonder Mondrian, Clay, Matisse loved these paintings uh, as has been pointed out repeatedly in various books. Naman, yes. sorry, I had to throw that in. No, I, 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 I and we've got a new audience member too at uh, Shogata's, <laughs> and that's, that's lovely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these pictures are communicating with us through so many metaphors. It's not just through the language of color and line, but through all the little elements that they are throwing into the mix which are telling us, you know, the, the mood of the woman being picked up by the doe who is looking back over her shoulder or the poignancy to the moment which is lent through the sky and the peacocks, um, through the flowering um, uh, vines and bowers in the, in the, in the landscape, um, telling you about the fragrance at that hour of the night or in the evening. 
could you move on to to the next? Um, I I think in order to be able to read these app, this kind of abstraction, we need to start focusing more on the poetry and on the equally on the Ragmala tradition, because I think those are iconographic codifications of moods. And if we know how to read those, we can see what the painter is trying to tell us in pictures. But again, that is very context specific. You have to be able to be uh, clear that this was how mood was constructed in Ragamala paintings in this particular region at this particular time. And therefore, we can extrapolate from that and look at the other paintings that were being made in that same region at that time to be able to come up with a very reasonable method to, to say that's what the poet or the, what the painter is intending. Yeah, you know, we don't always figure out the enigmas of these paintings. This one still awaits uh, figuring out what is it about. Uh, we certainly see the splendor of the marbling technique, uh, which one could talk about at length, uh, but we are sort of running out of time and we've got a couple of very exciting things to see before we uh, take questions. So I'll move on Thank to you, this, this amazing painting, one of the earliest that we acquired. And you see something that you may know the story, which you probably do, of Ravan's son Indrajit uh, having the boon of invisibility <laughs> and therefore coming and shooting his snake arrows at Ram and Lakshmana and essentially bringing the whole story to an ending quite different from the one we have all known. Uh, now the artist has resorted to a technique. This is not unique. I mean, this has been done in paintings of the Nala, the Miyanti also, but much more dramatically here than in all of those other paintings, all in the family, the same family of artists. And uh, it's something that one has to develop an understanding of. When I bought this picture, somebody else had been shown the same picture, a very distinguished collector whose name I will not mention, given that the party is still alive, and had scoffed the art dealer saying, you are trying to sell me an unfinished painting. My good luck that I was the next one there. I looked at it I immediately from hearing at Ram Leela, in my childhood, the story of Indrajit saying, oh, Indrajit invisible. And he said, may you have a long life and sold it to me for a rather big song, but a song all the same. So enigmas like this abound. And uh, someday I hope we will be able to talk about it at, at some length. But there is another interesting detective story I do wanna share. You can see in the details how you discover things. See the snakes, the blood coming out? Yeah. After owning the painting for close to 50 years, it was in fact this year or no, no, last year that looking at the painting, we noticed the blood. Mm -hmm. So indeed these paintings reveal the secret slowly. Let me bring you to Naman, how much time can we spend on him? <laughs> well, he's been somebody I've been dying to work on. It would on be for nice to get to Akbar. Really quiet. <laughs> okay, you want me to run through this? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think quickly, I think when you're concerned with photography and the idea of the shift in the nature of the self perception, you know, going from the represent, what I wanted to show was how the idea of the self and the body have been constructed so differently and how they are psychological insights which are culture, culturally conditioned and specific to their time. And um, Ram Singh II is a particularly interesting character because he straddles this shift from traditional Indian miniature, or oh, <laughs> I've done it, uh, to painting tradition. You're in the doghouse with me for using that term. <laughs> done. Um, and and uh, into the world of Indian um, uh, photography. And the fact that he took all these remarkable self-portraits, which he painted over, 
or had painted over, we don't know if he painted over them himself, um, are quite telling of what is the projection that he is trying to make to whom, why, um, in, and the times in which he lives. Could, could you show us the pictures that you, you know, I wanted to bring a, another point out. In an extremely tradition-bound society, the Rajputs were really not that inventive in that sense, okay? This guy, I think, was quite a maverick. He, as soon as the camera sort of became easily available, somewhere in the 1860s, I think he met Samuel Bourne, he acquired photographic equipment and started taking literally hundreds and thousands of photographs. Now, interestingly, although he did take landscapes and you know those kinds of things, he did something extremely unusual, in my opinion, intimate photographs. He took self-portraits, bringing up various characteristics of kingship, I suppose, or what the perception should be of kingship. But even in his zenana of the ladies, now there are a huge number of glass negatives in Jaipur, which are now being studied and examined, etc. And they've even held a little symposium on it. But Elvira and I are lucky that we found the rare examples of his photographs, prints outside India. We found this portrait and you see clearly the relationship to the painted image we saw a moment ago and we will go back to it. This is an image that I wish I owned the print, but I don't. Uh, and this is from our collection where you know he follows the same Pasavan in multiple photographs. And then somehow that sensibility that comes from a photographic image is transformed into these painted images. The way of looking at yourself and being looked at. The one on the left, I sometimes sit back and say that he may have done the overpainting himself. This is not unusual. Other Maharajas and princes did paint. We have a painting done at Devgarh by one of the princes. There is one in the Ashmolean or somewhere of a Mewar ruler doing it, okay? Uh, and then the one on the right, who knows who did it? Certainly not him, I would think. And these things just keep on intriguing us. And he, despite the structure he was in, despite the British uh, you know, demanding X, Y, and Z, did explore things. But I'm gonna move us forward in the interest of time. You can look carefully at this. He is ensnaring the audience. He's not just trying to sort of, but I think he's doing it more for himself than anybody else. And right. that's what makes his things related to him so special to me. I want to look at this. There's somebody in the audience who will, I think, enjoy it. This is one of the paintings. We and I don't own many Mughal paintings. Uh, the high rollers had already bought them all and the new high rollers from the Gulf are willing to pay a million dollars a painting because they, they don't earn the money. It comes out of the ground. Uh, I don't have a well anywhere. But this painting came by and it was so finely done uh, that we acquired it. Now, people again have been spinning all kinds of stories about it. It shows Jahangir and his father Akbar on the right, Jahangir on the left, in an act of salutation. But what the heck is going on? The fact remains that Jahangir, Prince Salim, rebelled against his father at the end of the 1500s because his father kind of got, uh, got, got sick. And he said, well, before any of my brothers take over the throne, I might as well declare myself the emperor and created an atelier. People started painting there, uh, started minting money, started having the khutba told in his name on Friday prayers, basically becoming the emperor uh, himself. The, animosity between the two was intense. Akbar brought back one of his leading generals from the 
Meccan, Jahangir had him murdered on the way, that's Abul Fazl. So these two had no love lost. But in 1604, peace was made because Akbar's health was dwindling. Jahangir becomes emperor in 1605. This painting was certainly made after 1605. We know that for many reasons. But well, what the heck? Why would someone who hated his father with such intensity have Akbar's favorite artist, Manohar, who grew up in the household of Akbar, makes this image? Well, one art historian said, maybe as Jahangir got older, he felt more softly about his father. And this is an act of sort of making peace with his late father. You know, quite plausible. I, however, somehow wasn't happy with it. So I decided to dig in. Where better than, than to look in Jahangir's own diary, Jahangir Mama, and guess what I found? It's a well-known thing, actually, as Naman told me, but you know, it's connecting the dots that's more important than the dots themselves. Here's a passage. Jahangir goes to Ajmer in July 1614. After a period of some three weeks, you know, he wasn't feeling well. He recovered his health. And he says then, during my illness, I said to myself that if I was granted a recovery, just as inwardly I was a devotee and believer in the exalted Khwaja, outwardly too, I would pierce my ears and join the circle of his ear pierced devotees. I had my ears pierced and put a lustrous pearl in each ear. Well, if you look closely at the painting, he's wearing a pearl in his ear. So this painting is done after 1614. This is how this detective work works, okay? And I'm saying all this because there are students listening. Don't give up. I'm 75 years old. I figured this out at the age of 73. I'd owned the painting for several decades. Fortuitously, we find on the very next page the following thing of the Jahangir Nama. One night during day, I dreamed that His Majesty Arsh Ashiani was saying to me, Baba, for my sake, forgive Aziz, by whom he meant Khan Azam. That's uh, Aziz Koka that we know a lot about, who was the uh, milk brother, foster brother of Akbar. After the dream, I decided to summon him from the fortress. So this painting immediately takes on a different character. Jahangir, as he has done on many occasions, had his artists paint what he saw in a dream. They believed that dreams came from God. So they were major things to be celebrated. And so here, it isn't Jahangir just making peace with his late father because of a change of heart. It is because of a divine message, which he had Manohar paint. Manohar was very fond of Akbar. This is well known uh, from many sources and Manohar has painted them beautifully. Jah Jahangir's submission is quite notable because the what he is doing with his hand touching his forehead is not just an ordinary salute like you know a late president our past president would do to the troops here you know <coughs> this is called the koronush a custom that Humayun formalized where basically jahangir is taking his touching his head saying i offer my humble obedience to you, I am giving you my mind. This is the most abject of respectful symbols he's doing. And so if you look hard enough, these paintings talk to you in ways that are not on the surface. And for me, this was so moving to discover this. I hope Kavita Singh is listening. She is the pioneer of writing about um, many dream paintings. So Kavita, this is a humble contribution by me. Milo Beach was ecstatic when I shared my essay with him. And uh, so we, you know, amateurs do sometimes make little contributions. 
Naman, take it away. This is the last picture. So for sure. Great. Thank you, Gushal. I mean, I think that was, it's a great note for us to end on. Um, I, and people I, can send us questions by email. I would love to answer them. I am so sorry, but I think the chance to share with you these visual things and the understanding of them would have been very difficult any other way. Well, the connection that I really wanted to make with the last one to this was the quality of the dream and something that <clears throat> the Rampur Raza Library had um, awakened me to thinking about, which was through the manuscript of the Tarjama Sir Al Maktoum, which they have over there, which I was baffled by when I first saw it, because paintings in that manuscript served as talismans. And talismans which are not meant to function by telling you a story necessarily, but just because of what they visually communicate. And, and that got me thinking about a whole genre of other paintings that exist, which opened up a definitional matter of what paintings can do and what the visual is capable of achieving for us. And that can be when it comes to, for instance, things like the Swapna Darpan series or any of these others, which actually have paintings that are meant to communicate something in the visualization which is almost supposed to be transformative for the person who is looking at them. Not because they're telling you a story, but because the language of painting itself can have a certain magic in it, in what it can do to the sensibilities of the onlooker. And the fact that there was an entire genre of paintings where there was bibliomancy or there were divination cards, or when it comes to the whole idea of even ingesting the written word uh, ingesting portions of a manuscript as people were meant to do and how manuscripts were even used um, really expands our definition of what paintings can do and how we can start studying paintings in a whole variety of ways that we hadn't actually um, necessarily considered when we teach the subject. Um, thank you very much, Gorsharan, and thank you very much, Shogata, for the invitation. I have, uh, like I said, I feel like a bit of a an imposter in the world of painting. And um, this has really been a, a great privilege that Gosharan has allowed me to see this collection and enjoy um, uh, looking at these pictures for the past few years. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I wish we could continue. And as, as both of you were speaking, I was thinking about a workshop where we invite both of you to Berkeley and we have a set of conversation over a week. One and a half hours is not enough to talk about all the various sorts of themes that you brought up, starting from archival research to the to memories, to how to study paintings, and even the question of abstraction. And I wish we had more time. And I seriously think we should plan on a workshop in Berkeley where we could actually get together and have this conversation. We are- Shivata, I would be delighted to do it I had on many occasions offered, for instance, Stanford University to use our collection to actually teach students. Uh, but you know, S Seattle and uh, Berkeley are far apart. Uh, but I do want to mention something for people in the audience. You know, usually it's very tempting to show what one could call eye candy in these talks beautiful paintings. What Naman has done today is selected things that had something deeper associated with them. And I was very happy that he did that. And I want to especially thank him for that and for the occasion of actually talking to an academic audience who would appreciate such kinds of delving on detail and connecting disparate things. Big thank you to all of you. So uh, as we wrap up our program for today, uh, my thank you to both of you for, for taking us through this wonderful journey through paintings from, from South India to the Rajasthan. And also many thanks to the audience for being here with us. Uh, all our programs are available on online and as will today's talks. If you want to refer back to all these 
beautiful paintings and all the debates and the conversations that emerged. Please go, please check it out on, on YouTube. The South Asia Art Initiative also has a full and robust uh, roster of programs this semester, and the full program is available on our website. I hope you'll continue to join us. We are really humbled and inspired by, by the audience who have joined from all over the world. And for that very reason, we are actually thinking that once we resume in-person gathering and when we invite, for instance, Naman and Gusharan to come and do a workshop in Berkeley, we will adopt a hybrid model. So I hope you will join us and we will forward Naman and Gursharan the questions that you've posted on the Q&A function. I wish we had more time. We could have talked more about all these very important discussions on how to think and see and write about Indian art. But for now, alas, we have to end the program here. Thank you, Naman. Thank you, Gursharan. Thank you so much. Thank you.